The Micronesian is first and foremost a member of a social group. <clears throat> Everything that he and she is stems from the social identity. There's a Bantu proverb that says, I am because we are. The social life of a Micronesian, a social identity of a Micronesian, so that, for instance, uh, one of the things I'm always telling people is that there's nothing as important to a traditional Micronesian. Now, admittedly, there may have been changes, but to a traditional Micronesian is being rooted in the family. I mean, that's number one, that's the basis of self-esteem, you know, that's rock bottom. So I felt if I could give people uh, some idea of what's important, some idea of the fact that smiles have many different meanings in, di in cultures. That when a person says, uh, yes, I will, even though he knows he can't, is he telling a lie or is he telling a social truth which turns out to be something that he can't really act on? You see, things like that, they, they, they constitute the, the problems that, that, that people have with, uh, with Micronesians. In the 1960s, few Micronesians visited the U.S. AFS students, military, hospital referrals, and other short-termers. In the early 1970s, with the extension of the Pell Grant, Micronesians began flocking to college in the U.S. By the late 1980s, the newly implemented Compact de Free Association allowed islanders to live and work in the U.S. Under the trusteeship, we've come to know and respect you as members of our American family. And now, as happens to all families, members grow up and leave home. Together, in free association, we can and will build a better life for all. I don't think the negotiators ever thought that large numbers of Micronesians would emigrate to the U.S. No one had any idea large, large numbers would come seeking the economic opportunity, which is not available, unfortunately, in the islands in this day and age. The outflow began in the late 1980s as a trickle moved to Guam and then Saipan. By 1995, with the step-down in compact money and the FSM economy in reverse, the trickle grew to a stream. Each year since then, FSM has been sending off 2,000 people a year. The Marshalls is losing 1,000 and Palau several hundred. The door was open and migration began in earnest. My name is Shru. I'm from Kushai. Tonde, Micronesia. I'm from Tsuk. Marcelana. I'm from Palau. I'm from uh, outer island of Chuk. No, not Chuk. He's from Mu. I'm from Madonia. Island of Sefen. I'm from Kushai. I'm from Bombay. I'm from Chuk. I'm from uh, Namrug Airport. From Ping. From Ping Lab also. <laughs> Chuk Island in Micronesia. And I'm from Palau. And I'm from Kushai. The fat that thing. <laughs> I'm from Mokil. John Gishel, I'm from Yap. Pulin Sokon Gatrik Sapuafik Pone Bay FSM 96941. Today, there are over 30,000 people from the Federated States of Micronesia living abroad. In another 10 years, that number will expand to 50,000.
Welcome to the new Micronesia. Welcome Micronesia, Bonapians, Marshallese, Oshayan, St. Jude. Here it is, Naori, Napen, Oma, Bilawa. Wayo, wayo, welcome Maria. In the minds of some observers, the outflow of Micronesians is a matter of concern. It is seen as evidence of the failure of Micronesians to develop their own economy back home. A U.S. government report issued by GAO in 2001 stated that a majority of the islanders who have moved to the U.S. and its territories are living in poverty. Newspaper articles sometimes suggest that islanders have come abroad to live off welfare, to be supported at U.S. taxpayers' expense. There's a lot of things, I guess there's a lot of things to say. I'm, um, let, me, let, me, let me start off with some practical things, okay? I want to see my Canadians better connected. And when I say better connected, I want to see Micronesians here well connected with their, the people, their families back in the, their home islands. And if they decide to stay after college, then I still want them to be connected to the point where they visit, they uh, make calls, they email, they do whatever their Facebook, you know, do whatever they're doing to keep in touch with them. I would like to see them, when they're working, uh, send money back home, remittances because that's important in Tonga and Samoa, and I think it could be important in Micronesia as well. Once upon a time, uh, eight years ago, in 2006, the a remittance amount for FSM was about 18 million a year. Now, 18 million a year was 8% of the gross national product at that time, so it's not negligible. I'm afraid that since that time, the remittance amount has dropped rather than increased. When I say connected, I also mean connected with, uh, you know, with one another, of course. But Micronesians are good in doing that all around the states. Migrant communities are, are uh, doing extraordinary things in keeping connected with themselves. Well, that's a matter of survival. You know, you have to have like-minded people, people who represent your culture. It's certainly an advantage having that. Uh, sports competitions that they have, you know, and things like that. But I mean, I mean in another way. I mean, I would like to see them con in close contact with the consular office. I would like to see when a Micronesian is accused of domestic violence or child abuse or something like this, locking the kids in the car, you know, whatever it is, I'd like to make sure that that person has protection, has legal assistance. I'd like to make sure that there's somebody on hand who can provide a cultural explanation to people who are perhaps a little too zealous in, you know, in, 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 in having people comply with American standards, particularly if nobody is being harmed. I'd like a network of uh, honorary councils around the U.S. I'd like an honorary council here on the Big Island. Why shouldn't there be? There's a significant uh, uh, Micronesian population here. That's, that's what I mean by connectedness. Okay. I'm surprised at how little people here seem to know about, uh, about Micronesian culture and uh, behavior. Now, I'm not surprised that they don't know anything about Micronesia. I mean, why should they know something about Micronesia? These people descend on them. But these are island people. You know, you would think that people who've lived in an island for a hundred years or so their families have been here. You would think that Native Hawaiians and Samoans, for heaven's sakes, and even Filipinos who've been here for a long time, as well as Japanese and Okinawans and all these other people, would come to an appreciation of what Ohana is. They're always talking about it. You would think that they'd come to an appreciation of how um, the last group 
to come is a group that always gets pilloried. They're the all, always a group that gets attacked. They're the group that gets attacked because they have weird behavior. You know, because uh, Micronesian women wear these funny skirts, you know, with the embroidery down at the, uh, at the bottom and so forth. Huh? And guys are always throwing their soda cans or whatever into, uh, on the street or spitting red. Uh, there's this, this kind of thing has happened to other waves of, of migrants into the islands. And I would, I'm a little surprised that, um, that people can't, a little, can't more easily identify you know, with, with Micronesian behavior, or at least understand it in the context of island style. Well, I think that the, uh, I think that uh, Micronesians are taking good in initiatives to it. And let me tell you that I'm quite impressed with the readiness of, of people, including people from here, the Big Island, to uh, call on somebody who's got some kind of an understanding of this. I'm talking about teachers, and uh, social service providers and, you know, even medical providers. There was one time uh, some years ago when I, I came from Panapai on an overnight flight to Honolulu and I had to catch a flight, I had to catch a flight early in the morning to get to the Big Island. And the, the reason for coming to the Big Island was to do an all-day thing with a presentation, all-day presentation with school teachers and so forth. There were about 70 people, and there were only, they were limited to 70 because we couldn't fit anymore in there. We started, this was after an all-nighter, I started at 9 o'clock in the morning and went till 4 o'clock. And you know, these people wanted to continue after 4 o'clock. They were hungry to learn something about, uh, about Islanders. So they've done, at least in those days, they were, uh, and that was some years ago, they were taking steps to get information to prepare themselves to deal with, uh, with Micronesians. Micronesians could help by staying out of jail, for one thing, by not getting into gang fights, and by being able to walk away, you know, from uh, some of the hostility that comes up. Uh, they can, uh, they help, they can help, and they are helping by going to church. And I say that not just because I am an ordained minister, but because churches are hugely important in settling people down in any migrant community. So if they get to the extent that people can do that, that's, but that's wonderful too. Well, one piece of advice is remember your own family history. You know, the other piece of advice is if you want to begin to understand these people, make one friend, and that's what Bob Ryan and some of these people at Milan, Minnesota did. Make one friend. I had to do that when I was in Chuk and in, in Micronesia. I had, I had more than one friend, but, uh, but I always found myself, if I could put a face on the culture, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to make uh, condemnations of it. I wasn't going to be as critical of it. Because it wasn't, I wasn't speaking just against this abstraction in culture, but I was speaking against this particular individual and his family, and I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to do that. So my advice to Peace Corps volunteers and other volunteers over the years has been, during your two years on the island, just make sure that you end up with a couple good friends. And I'd say that to anybody here. Then other things flow from that. And, See, I'm saying that you have to have sort of a sympathetic heart. Once you have a sympathetic heart, then you begin to understand. But you don't go through the ABCs of culture first. You know, that doesn't mean anything unless you're open-minded and open-hearted. The Big Island's always been famous for this place, UH Hilo. I mean, uh, years ago, we were sending people here. And we always had this trade-off, you know. UH Hilo is not Honolulu, it's not the main center and everything like this. And you may not get the range of course offerings that you'd get, you know, that here, that you'd get there. But uh, it more than compensates for that, by the fact that there's a close, you know, protective community. I've, I've been here now for four times, maybe, and uh, there's always been this, I've gotten a sense that there's always people play basketball together, you know, and they, uh, they do a lot of things together. And I've always gotten a sense that they're really well taken care of. And when I say well taken care of, I mean by the university as well. There's always been a program you know, to provide for these people. So, 
Well, you know I'm a Jesuit. I'm a priest. Uh, a teacher. I like to style myself as a teacher. A teacher who's, I hope, a conversationalist because that was my teaching style too. At least that's what I hope it was. But a tough teacher. A demanding one. At least that's how I like to think of myself. A teacher who's never stopped being, being a teacher. You know, although now uh, the class is really the public, and as I said, this is this comes across as more of a uh, discussion, I hope, or conversation than it is a one-way presentation. Um, the important thing to me is to communicate to the people of Micronesia that they shouldn't be left out of a world conversation. The important thing was that, that nobody should be left out because they live in the northwest quadrant of the Pacific or because they just have a population of 100,000 or 50,000. Uh, I felt passionate about this when I was in theology in the 1960s and I feel just as passionate about it today. There are no people who are left out. There are no people who are superfluous or who, who aren't worthy of consideration. If any of us Jesuits had any claim to fame in Micronesia, you know, I mean our life most for the most part has been dealing with a small group of people who never make headlines, uh, we ourselves don't make headlines, we're doing sort of grunt work, at least most of us do, for most of our lives. Um, and we're not doing it uh, among the, uh, the people who are the, uh, uh, the masters of the world, you know. Uh, so what's the point of it? Well, the point of it is just what I've said. To make a statement that everybody counts. And I think that statement is just as true within Micronesia as it is comparing Micronesia with the outside world. So that if it's people from Kapinga, if it's people from, you know, from Mogil, uh, whatever, they also count. If it's people who haven't had an education, education or people who, as the Chukis would say, are Sokongao, you know, touched, Salia, uh, you know, then these people too. Um, that's a statement that I make as a human being and certainly as a Jesuit because uh, my purpose, I suppose, was to bring a little touch of the Lord and love, you know, to this uh, society. I couldn't do much. I mean, none of us uh, really can do, we are in a position where we can do much. But we can be representative of something that's all around them. And if myself or any of us Jesuits have done that to any extent, then we're happy and proud.